Throughout the book of Revelation, there's a theme of redemption. I've heard preachers preach on the book of Revelation all my life, I guess. And often, it's, it's, when they get through, I'm terrified, I'm scared, I'm nervous. But there's a theme throughout Revelation that is about redemption. God loves you and cares for you, and he reaches out to you, and he opens his arms to receive you into himself. If only you will have him. But throughout the book of Revelation, it's also very clear that there are some people who will reject Jesus no matter what. There are people in the world today who are rejecting Jesus. There are some who are just absolutely uh, upset to the hilt because of the Supreme Court decisions this week. And they're all based on the truths of God. The letters to the churches were calls to return to their first love, and, and that is Christ. Each time a seal judgment or bowl judgment or trumpet judgment was pronounced, it included a call to repentance to the Lord and, to, and reception of Him and His love. It's necessary that we be right with God if we're going to be blessed. And that's throughout the Scripture, taught throughout the Bible. The question is, are you right with God? Is your heart right with God? And there's something within that's it's what we know as the Holy Spirit. It draws us to God. It draws us to Him. It draws us to His Word, to His righteousness, to who He is about. And so when, when I ask the question, are you right with God? If you listen to that still, small voice inside, it will say, yes, well done, good and faithful servant. Or it will say, this area needs a little work. Or it will say, no, you've never received me as your Savior. Never received Jesus as your Savior, and you need to invite Him in your heart. It will speak to your heart, and you'll know where you are with God. Are you growing in your love for others? Are you growing in your forgiveness of others, in your kindness, in your patience, in your service, without complaining to God? Those are areas where we can grow because God offers us eternal life, redemption, and salvation. Chapter 19 tells us the preparations for the wedding supper. The wedding supper takes place before the wedding, but preparations will be made, including cleansing... Not just of individual hearts, but cleansing this world of the false systems, the false philosophies, and the false ways. In verse 1 and 2, the corruption of the earth will be removed. It talks about the prostitute uh, that's there and the false doctrines and the destruction that comes. And all of that is destroyed. And so, they say, hallelujah, praise God. Remember, we praise God for His attributes, not how we benefit, but His attributes. And here, it's hallelujah. God only can do this. Only God can cleanse the earth of all the sin of the world. Only God can take away all the false philosophies and the false ways of living and thinking and serving and doing and the self-centeredness that's in this world. Only God can take away all the evils and the pain and the suffering. And God does that. And so they say, hallelujah, praise God. We praise God for His attributes. We praise Him for His character. And it's about His character. Chapter 19 is full of praises of God. And we praise Him because of who He is. First, the first praise is that the earth is cleansed of all the false idols and secular philosophies that abound in this world. The second praise is that all the saints who were martyred 
because of their faith, are avenged for their deaths. In the end, all the mockery of God is going to be pushed aside by the truth of God. The law, the prophecy, the gospel of salvation, all that's going to take all the mockery of God away. It's going to push it aside. No longer will be, there be those who can stand up and say, God is to be mocked and made fun of. I see it all the time on social media. People ridiculing, slandering those who are speaking out God's word. But one day all that will be pushed aside. The truth of God will reign. In verse 3, Babylon will be destroyed. And Babylon could be figurative or literal. Either way, it's gone. And all it stands for it will be gone. It's not going to be there anymore. It will be gone. And the smoke, it says, it says the smoke goes up forever and ever. That is, it's permanent. All these philosophies that are idol worshiping, false worshiping, anything but God worshiping or serving, and it's all in, this, in our society, in our world, it's all about have it your way, do it your way, you have your own ideas, you do what you want to do. That's the kind of idol worship. It's all going to be gone. It won't be in there anymore. And the self-centered pursuit of luxury will be gone that could be found in Babylon. In verse 4 and 5, with assurance... With assurance, the wedding is planned. When uh, our daughter got married, it was when COVID just broke out. And she had all the plans made. And one day the church called and said, you can't have your wedding here. We're going to do renovation during this time. We're not meeting and we're going to do renovation. And it was all, all her plans were dashed. There wasn't an assurance. We didn't know what we were going to do. It worked out great, by the way. If you want to know the end of the story, ask Ann. But it worked out great. But we didn't have assurances. But with this wedding feast, there will be an assurance. Things aren't ready yet, but they know there's going to be a wedding. They know it's going to take place. The 24 elders and the four living creatures will support the destruction of Babylon. And they'll praise God for that destruction, that cleansing that comes over the earth. And the, the praise will continue and keep on going. In that verse is the word, Amen. A-M-E-N. Amen. This is one of the strongest words that we have in the Bible of agreeing with God. It's a word that, that means sacred ratification or affirmation. It's a word that seals or binds. It's total agreement with God. It's total submission to God's word. A literal translation may be, so be it. And so when we say, amen... We're saying we totally agree with the Word of God. And we see that word throughout Scripture. Amen. Every now and then it's just there. And you say, well, what's that there for? Well, it's a total, total agreement with God. It's agreeing with His Word without reservation. It's accepting it without question. And it's, it's doing what God, God's Word says. It's totally agreeing with God, His righteousness. It's agreeing with His character. It's agreeing with everything about him. Amen. It's agreeing with God. And so he said, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And don't think your invitation is going to be automatic. Just because you're a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church or any other church doesn't mean that you're going to get an invitation to this wedding feast. If you're not a child of God, it doesn't matter how many churches you're a member of, you won't get an invitation to this wedding feast. But if you are a child of God, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're living for him, if you're saying amen to his call to salvation, then you will get an invitation. You have an invitation already with your name on it to this wedding feast. Those, those invited who say amen to the gospel of Jesus Christ and amen to the sanctification of their life in Jesus Christ, that is their set-apart lifestyle to live for Jesus Christ, will be included in the wedding feast. In verses 6 through 9, accepting and agreeing with the Lord reigns. In verse 7, there will be a wedding of the king. A king needs a bride. And so verse 8, the bride will be clothed in righteousness. We cannot approach God in unrighteousness. God does not look on sin. God cannot coexist with that which is not holy and righteous. And so he clothes the bride. In righteousness, the inner, there's an inner garment and an outer garment. 
The inner garment is that righteousness of God. God does that. God purifies our heart. Only God can purify our heart. We cannot do it. We can't turn over a new leaf. We can't live a better life. We can't just decide we're going to do better. We, we are sinners by nature and by our choice. So God does that work. And we, the inner garment would be God's righteousness that clothes us, that covers us, that protects us. The outer garment that one would wear would be our deeds, our good works that we do as we trust in Christ, as we follow his call in our life. And it would be the, the works that are righteous in our life. Our works are righteous before God when they're based on faith. We don't decide what we're going to do for God, and we don't decide what's righteous and what's not righteous in our life. He decides that. He tells us. He calls us to a ministry. And when we do what he's called us to do, that's where our righteousness comes from, our deeds come from, that we give him. That's what our reward will be based on as we follow him. As he calls us to be forgiving of others who have offended us so greatly, no matter how great it is, and we respond. That's works of righteousness. When we are loving those who are unlovable, those that are easy to love, it doesn't count so much, but those that are unlovable and he calls us to love, those are deeds of righteousness. As we give of our resources, as he leads us to give, those are works of righteousness based on our faith in him. And we give out of faith. And as we do, give our time and our resources, our effort, our emotion that was tied up in this, we receive a blessing for that when we serve God. That's our outer garment. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul wrote, For no other foundation can a man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Our foundation is in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15.58, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you serve the Lord, it's not in vanity. It's not, it's not wasted time. It's not something that you wish you hadn't done. When you're truly serving the Lord, it's a blessing to serve Him. Now, marriage is a symbol of a covenant. Satan, it's no wonder that Satan has worked to destroy the family and divorce reigns in our country. It has for years and years and years. And the family's destroyed, lives are destroyed because fa marriage represents a covenant. A greater covenant than what happens on earth is a covenant between the church and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that kind of covenant can't be broken. It will be forever and ever. The redeemed church will be the bride. Now, that doesn't cut out Israel. God, those are always God's people. Those of Israel who trust in Jesus will be among the redeemed and be part of the bride. Gentiles who accept Jesus as their Savior will be among the redeemed, part of the bride of Christ. And Paul wrote about how that's a mystery. Now, they didn't understand how that could be. It's a mystery. It's something that was not thought about. But that's how God wants it because he loves all people. In verse 9, he said, Blessed or happy are those invited. Those invited are all who have been followers of Jesus Christ, and they will be glad they did. In chapter 19, verse 11 through 21, there are still some preparations to be made. It's not done yet. The wedding is being planned, but there are still some preparations of cleansing that need to take place. And so he comes out in a white horse. This isn't the right horse of chapter 6. Remember when the white horse and the apple horse and the red horse, they went out? Those weren't Jesus riding those horses. That was the Antichrist. Jesus is not one that brings destruction just... Um, capriciously go out and cause destruction. He's one who brings peace and restoration. And so the white horse here and the rider is described, the description of the rider describes Jesus in the same way as in chapter 1 describes Jesus. So we know the rider is Jesus. And um, verse 11, the horse rider was faithful and true. And we know that's a description of Jesus. Verse 12 we see it's, a, again, the description that we see of, of Jesus, very similar to the description we see in chapter 1. In verse 13, his name is the word of God, or the standard of God, or the character of God. And it's always the character of God by which he judges, or the standard. It's who he is. He doesn't deviate from that. He's always open and honest and truthful and straightforward with who he is and what he expects. 
So he will return to judge the nations according to our faith. We will be judged and rewarded. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone will appear before Christ. Those who have accepted Jesus will be at that uh, judgment of the, uh, what the parable Jesus told, the sheep and the goats. And the sheep will be put one side and the goats will be put on the other side. Those saved will be separated from those that are unsaved. And the unsaved will be cast out. Their judgment's over. But then those who are saved will stand before the throne and be judged according to our faith. You have faith to be saved. That's a little bit of faith. But then as you have faith to continue to live the Christian life, to do what the Lord has for you to do, to transform your life, to change your life, your heart and your mind, your thinking, all of that is transformed to be more like Christ and the Word of God. That's the kind of faith you'll get a reward for that. In verse 14, he says his armies in heaven will follow him. That will be the angelic army, the angels, and it will also be all of those who are raptured back after verse uh, chapter 4, I think, uh, and, and there's a rapture. And he'll rule with a rod of iron. That, that almost sounds harsh. Rule with a rod of iron. But iron doesn't bend. It's not like a, something that's real flimsy in any way it, it uh, is tilted. It falls that way. Iron doesn't bend. And so God is not going to bend either. He's going to be steadfast. He's going to be consistent. What he's told us in his word will be what happens in judgment and what will be happening in eternity. He's always the same. And so if you know Jesus Christ, you'll know Jesus in judgment. You'll know Jesus in eternity. He's the same loving, caring, gracious God that we know through that for those who trust in him. In Isaiah 63, we learn that he has those armies with him, but he fights the battle alone. Very reminiscent of the cross. He had all the host of heaven there that would back him up. At his word, they would have destroyed the world, everybody in it. But he had a battle he had to face alone on the cross. He took the sins of the world on himself on the cross. He looked out and he saw they were gambling for his clothes taking the last possessions he had from him, stealing from him while he was dying on the cross, suffering on the cross. There's no crueler punishment than a cross and what, what that in, does to the body. And he looked at it and said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing. And with the same love he had to stay on the cross, he fought that battle alone. But when he died, it was for the salvation of the world. And because he was victorious, we can have salvation through him. Well, then when he comes again, he'll be facing the Antichrist, and it'll be a battle that he alone will be fighting. Be backed up by all those armies, but they, he won't need them because he's so powerful and great and strong. And he'll face the Antichrist, and the first, um, first one to, um, to, to die in the conflict will be Antichrist. In verse 15, it says there's a sword coming out of his mouth. And that's, that's been my sticking uh, verse all week, trying to figure out what does that mean. And we, if we go back to the Genesis, we know that, and, and also um, in Colossians, we know also, Jesus spoke the world into existence. Out of his mouth came the words, the world, trees, oceans, fish birds. He spoke and it came about. And so out of his mouth is, is a powerful uh, word of God. We also know in Hebrews, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of asunder of both soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so when the scripture says a sword coming out of his mouth, it's talking about something powerful that's coming out, and in this case, a, a defensive weapon. But the defensive weapon is going to be the gospel. The gospel of salvation. The good news of salvation. Jesus came to this world, and with that, he's going to destroy all those that are opposed to him. I can't tell you how. That's God's problem. He's just telling us it's going to happen, and it's going to happen. And we may say, that sounds crazy. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't have to 
make sense. It doesn't have to be something we can comprehend. What we do is we believe the word of God is going to happen. Out of his mouth will come a, a sword that will destroy all the wickedness and evil and corruptness in this world. It may be long in coming because we know God is patient. You think about in the days of Noah. It took Noah 100 years to build the ark. There are a lot of people making fun of Noah during those 100 years. There's this crazy old man building a something, big old boat, and there's not any water anywhere near here for 100 years. And they got to where they were uh, very complacent in the fact they needed to repent. They began to mock Noah. They began to mock his message that they needed to repent, that judgment was coming. But then one day, thunder sounded, the rain started. The waters came up, the rain came down, and they all drowned. God was patient for a hundred years, but his word prevailed. God's word is going to prevail. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus died. It may be 2,000 more. We don't know. God is patient. But he's patient so that he gives every individual opportunity to receive him as their Savior. In verse 11 through 20, the Antichrist will be a powerful and awesome leader. He's going to be good looking. He's going to be strong, impressive to see. He will seem invincible, much like King Saul was. He was head and shoulder above the crowd. He was good looking. He was strong. He was a great warrior. But in one day, he and both his sons died, just like that. We need to be careful of following the world's alternatives to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many philosophies in the world that are alternatives. And they sound good. They're self-serving. And we need to be careful. Every alternative to Jesus Christ will end in bondage. Every alternative to Jesus Christ will end in bondage. It may be strong bondage that you feel. It may be kind of not so bad. But it's going to be something that tends to bind you. It will restrict you. You'll feel trapped in that system unless you turn to Jesus Christ. And if you find yourself in that situation, turn to Jesus Christ now and he can free you from that bondage. But every alternative will end in bondage. Only the way of God. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundant. The way of God is life. The way of God is peace. And and it's an abundant life. a, A life worth living. Suicide is the greatest taker of lives of young people in today's world. Because they're in some kind of bondage that they've chose the world system. They don't know the peace of Christ. They don't know the freedom that can come from him. And so we need to be telling it. But every other philosophy of life leads to disaster and death. In verse 17 and 18, um, the, let's see, 17... The angel I saw standing in the sun cried in a loud voice to all the birds of the flying in midair, Come gather together for the great supper of God. And here's a pronouncement. Remember David and Goliath? And David went down to fight Goliath. And um, he was just, uh, to Goliath, he was just a young man. Now he was probably as big as Saul. Uh, so he's probably a tall, lanky young man running toward Goliath. And Goliath said, Are you going to send a a boy out here to do a man's work? Come on out here. I'm going to feed you to the birds. And David said, no, that's not going to happen. I'm going to be feeding you to the birds today. And that's an expression, an idiom of of, um, just kind of putting him down. It's a, a disrespect, a symbolic of death, of defilement, defeat. And so here it is in... Revelation, all those who opposed God, who thought they were right, who thought they were going to live their own way forever, their bodies are going to be fed to the birds. And if we look in Ezekiel, not only the birds, but the animals in the field will come up, scavengers, and, and feast on all the bodies that are destroyed. All right, so in, in Revelation 19, 19 through 21... This is the victorious verse. The outcome of all the battles through history, Satan will be defeated, and Satan's hosts will be defeated, and Jesus Christ will be King of kings, Lord of lords. Jesus speaks, and it's over, just like that. 
So all this hoopla, all this buildup throughout history of, of Satan's way and Satan's kingdoms, and, and he rises up kingdoms, and they may last a couple hundred years, and they're destroyed, and another one, and, and it's destroyed, another and it's destroyed. And in all this big talk, and Jesus speaks, and it's over, just like that. And so who are you following? The world system, your system, or the one who can speak and change everything? Now, there's another note to keep in mind. There's not a description of the wedding, nor is there a description of this great battle. There are hints of it throughout other places in Scripture, but there aren't descriptions right here. And it may be that those pale in comparison to Jesus. And I, I've told the church through the years, don't give your testimony and spend an hour telling us how bad you were and five seconds telling us how Christ changed your life. Spend five seconds telling us you were a sinner and an hour telling us what Jesus is doing in your heart. And it may be that. The, the wedding feast itself and the great battle, okay, they happen. But let's talk about the Savior. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about how wonderful he is, how his love and grace is there for us. And emphasize that. You know, when I'm counseling young couples that come to the office that are going to get married... I spent a lot of time, most of the time, uh, talking about the wedding. Not the wedding, the marriage. Talking about the, the marriage. What's it going to be like? How, how are they going to be, how do they spend money? Are they going to have struggle with it or not? I can tell them that. Their personality inventory, where are they going to have strengths and weaknesses? I can tell them that uh, through their inventories they fill out. We talk about different things about the being married. And then when we get through with all that, we spend a few minutes, we talk about the wedding itself. The wedding doesn't last too long. Maybe if you count the party that goes with it, an hour or two, the ceremony lasts about ten minutes. But living together in marriage lasts for forever until you die. Are you preparing to be with Jesus in heaven for eternity, the long haul? Or is your goal simply make sure you're in the rapture? Are you looking at the ceremony or are you looking at the life to live? All those who say they have their own way of worship and their own beliefs, they're going to be among the defeated. And even as Christians, we can come in and say, well, I think, I, I th I think we're going to be this kind of Christian. No, 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 no. Look in the Bible. Be a biblical Christian. Be what the Bible says. The, the spirit of Scripture, the character of Jesus Christ lived out in your life the words of God, your life. All that laugh and mock at Christianity will discover they're, they're wrong, but it'll be too late. We have to get it right now. So death for one who rejects Christ will not be a good thing. Jesus said they will go to a horrible place. Look at Matthew 24. It'll be eternal death, suffering, pain, torment. But all who have trusted in Jesus... To die in Christ will be invited to the wedding feast and it will be joy and celebration and praising of God.